Hi, I'm Pamela. And I'm Susanna. Welcome to The Gussie, our weekly podcast for design junkies. At The Gussie, we break down the process of design and decode the many components that go into creating beautiful spaces, from treasure hunting to furniture layouts, textiles, and much, much more. We're friends and design partners who believe everyone should be able to create a stylish home that reflects who they are and how they want to live. Plus, we love to talk. Let's get into it. Hi, Pam. Hi, Susanna. Should I call you Pamela? Yeah, I like Pamela better, actually. You you do? Oh, well, I find it kind of odd when people always ask you, like, should I call you Pamela or Pam? I'm like, just call me something nice. Like, (laughs) just something positive. Right, just not bitch. Yeah. (laughs) Well, you know, it's funny, when I first met you, I heard some, I think it was Francesca, I heard another girl that works with us calling you Pam. And so I was like, okay, so her good friends call her Pam. But then whenever you introduce yourself, I hear you say, I'm Pamela. Yeah. I think it's sweeter. Yeah. And I think it actually means honey, which could be like, you know, it's like sweet into the In what the language? Taste. I don't know. I think it might, might be like Latin. Okay. Anyway. So how you doing? I'm doing very well. I'm very excited about this new venture. Um, I feel like we're birthing a child together. I agree. I agree. I feel like, remember that movie Baby Boom? No. Oh my God. It's such a good movie. It's it's so amazing. What's her name? Diane Keaton? Diane Keaton. So she's like corporate badass, you know, like, you know, just doing it all, ends up adopting a baby and like moves to the country and starts making like little jams. And, but like it becomes a passion. Yeah. And then it becomes a business. Well, yeah. I mean, that's how we all get started, right? In something we love. Let's talk about like just the genesis of it all. Like, why did we decide to do a podcast? Because I think that's kind of an interesting story. Um, why did you decide to do a podcast with me? Because I think, I think you, was it you or was it me that sort of like said, hey, we need to do a podcast? I mean, it's always me, you know? Yeah. No. <laughs> we were drunk. Um, I think I think it was one of the many nights or many days when we had opened up a bottle of Sancerre. <laughs> right. I think one of the things that, that attracted me to this project was that whenever we get into a car to go to, like, say, a client who lives outside of Greenwich or yeah. outside of Fairfield County, yeah. and we're stuck in the car for an hour and a half, yeah. I actually enjoy that car ride probably more than the design it's because so we true. have such great conversations. Should we get to our first special topic? I will let you lead the way into our special topic. Okay. All right. So today's special topic is elements of style. Okay. Um, and, you know, I think it's just a very natural place to start um, for our first show. And it's really kind of where we start with our clients when a client, you know, walks through the door. Um, so can you tell me a little bit about, sorry, I'm putting you in the hot seat now. Um, can, and I think I know some of this, but um, they're always like little jewels that come out. Um, can you tell me a little a bit about your style evolution and sort of like where this, how you got into design and where this all started for you? Oh, goodness. Okay. Um that's a that's a multifaceted question. So let's break it down. Okay. Um, let's start with the beginning. Right? Okay. Because um, people always, you know, when I meet them, they'll say, "Oh, you're an interior designer." Yeah. And sort of pigeonhole me in that in that, and and I and I always stop them and say, "Well, you know, interior design is something I do, but I do a lot more." You yeah. know, I um, I think that running a business being a mom, um, uh, having an interior design business, understanding the components of what makes great rooms. Like there's so many different facets to our yep. business. So how about this? Were, what did your home look like in your 20s? Oh my God, in my 20s. Well, I was in college in my 20s. Oh, okay. I have a great story. That's a good question. So the start of my of my first apartment, I had two nickels to rub together. Okay. I mean, I, I, I was in San Diego and... I knew I wanted a really cool, chic apartment. So I found a great apartment with like a great view, great layout. And I got in my car and I literally drove to the Goodwills and Salvation Armies all over San Diego. And at that time, you know, San Diego was very much um, 
a, a town or a city that was, you know, uh, there was a lot of movement. There was a lot of people coming in and going out. Um, and it was growing. So your, your fines in, in these, like, you know, thrift shops were pretty good. And I remember I got, like, a Roche Boubois sofa in this beautiful boucle. And it was $100, which was a lot of money for me. Right. But I was determined to own the sofa. And I think I purchased it without actually knowing how I would move it, who I would hire. I mean, I was living by myself. Right. Um, somehow I managed to get a, a mover to come and, and get it. And then, you know, I sort of, I discovered C- C- Crate and Barrel. Yes. They had opened up in the mall. And I was pretty wowed by their, like, you know, organization, their desks and things like that. Yeah. So I sprinkled in some... Um, CB, Crate and Barrel. I was going to say CB2, but at that time it was just Crate and Barrel. And then, you know, found like a vintage coffee table and, you know, added a lot of gray art. So I had that sort of boho chic look before yeah. it was really in, in vogue. So that doesn't surprise me about you. It really wasn't until my 30s that I started to sort of look around and notice, wow, you know, a friend or, you know... Um, a great spread in El Decor. Like, look how people are living. But was this was this before you had kids or after you had kids that you started to become more aware of how you lived? Because, I mean, that's essentially what it is. Like, you yeah. know. That's, I mean, that's a huge, you know, turning point, I think, in someone's life. And, you know, definitely sort of the time that we start to think about nesting. So I would say I lived with so right after I had kids we had those like hideous rubber tiles like all over so that like the kids could crawl do you remember those yes and I think it wasn't until my youngest was out of the baby phase and that I started and and that I started to live in my home you know I didn't go to an office every day and I started to really look around and think like this is such a huge part of our lives and it should speak to who we are and that's when I really started to to delve into design books and, you know, read the good, read Domino and um, El Decor and House Beautiful. And I started to sort of break down the science of what goes into a good room. And it, it was with fits and starts. I'm still evolving, I feel like, with my own personal style in my house. You know, I'm still weeding things out or at, as you know, or adding things. Um, but it really... Yeah, I was n- you. I think you were had a much sort of stronger sense of personal style when it comes to home than I did earlier on, and I wonder why. I mean, did were you ra- raised? Well, with I mean, I was I was raised by a single parent, a father who you know didn't have any idea what you know personal style was for your home. I mean, he just would put a leather couch in, you know, with a TV. You just just didn't know how to decorate. Right. And I think as a child, I was just hyper aware of what I didn't have. And so what I tried to do is every time I would go to a special place, yeah. maybe someone's home where their mom took the time to decorate, yeah. I would try to just absorb everything. I was, you know, if it was a museum or it was um, a, a house tour, if it was, I mean, I remember as a, a, a child, we went to visit um, the Winchester Mystery House, which is a quintessential, I, know I know, what that is. A quintessential house in um, Vict- old Victorian home in California, and it was a class trip. And what happened was, uh, can I just give you the backstory on yes, the Winchester? Yes, do. So, so the woman was married to the man who created Winchester rifles, and she had a dream if he died, and she was going to die if she didn't stop building on her house. So she had... There's a movie about this, Pam. So yes, there was. And she had people build on her house constantly. So as a child, I must have been in third or fourth grade. We went to visit this house. And I remember feeling like I was transported back in time, looking at the home, looking at at how she decorated. And I think that was the genesis of my design passion. I am a person who feels feels like I lived in another era at multiple eras. And the other thing is I love to absorb that. And if I wasn't getting that at home, I was getting it elsewhere. And then it just came, you know, where I would just take it all in. And then I started to dream and my senses were ignited when I thought about like, 
my first apartment, my first, you know, all those wonderful things. So it's so interesting because, you know, I grew up in, um, with a mother who what who was design was, focused. Yes. Yeah. And and in uh, sort of a serial renovator and in three different Victorian homes in Larchmont. Um, and you know, here on the East Coast. So, you know, you would think it would have sort of been in my DNA. And it's funny because and, and we're talking like chintz. Laura Ashley, oh. Mario Boada, yeah, you know, um, swags and and tassels, and you know, I had a little bit of a reaction to that. I think in my twenties, where I just wanted everything to be clean, to be like I didn't care if my sofa was, you know micro suede or whatever that awful sort of right. synthetic I just I wanted it to be clean and functional right and I did not want to live in my mother's home um as of sounds course, right sounds, sounds like our girls are gonna do one day. right of course fast forward <laughs> then you know all these years and like you know here I am and I'm like I'm turning into my mother um but I do I you know I do think when I look back I loved my dollhouse as a kid. I had a dollhouse. I, I did too. I had a dollhouse as well, and it was wallpapered. Me Someone too. Someone gave it to us, and it was, it was literally taller than me with empty rooms. But we we didn't have any Barbies or little dolls. So in my imagination, I had to create. Oh, so so I no so my dollhouse. I mean, I had all the fixins, all the of course, of course you did, of course. Of I course had all the beautiful stuff, but if you know, and but I would do things to it that you know I would get a lot of flack about. Like my mother would be like, "What did you do to the garage?" And I had decided <laughs> I had decided I wanted to paint the garage, you know, in the house, and I was very crafty. And it's interesting because when I listen to you know design podcasts or when I read these great books that we have, you know, almost every designer came to that we think of Jeffrey Bill Huber and Katie Ritter and all of the really fabulous designers that we love sort of came to it not knowing that design was an actual profession that people did. They all sort of started elsewhere. And, you know, uh, Ashley Whitaker started in uh, Ralph Lauren PR. And it's just, it's really interesting to me that we all sort of had these creative abilities, but none of us were told, you know, design could be your profession. So who would have thought that design would give you the creative, yep, the social, the everything you love? So going back, going okay. back to our sort of topic, you're going to kill me because I'm going to ask you some really hard questions. Um, don't on the first show. Yes. Okay. On the, you can you can handle All it. Right. Can I just can I preface your this con- conversation yes. and say I have no idea what you're going to ask me. So when you say hard questions, like literally, I'm wondering like, are these super personal or no. are they just design questions where I have to have like a like no okay I'm not I'm not this is not like a, I'm not giving you like a spelling test okay. of design terms right. okay I, these are just these are things that I struggle with I feel like when I am starting a, a project and okay. you know um it's just it's you know we never have time to sit and kind of ask each other how do you do this right. you know all right so I'm okay. ready for the first so question what do you do when a client comes in and they don't know who they are and they don't know what they want. Mm. Well, you know, that's like my biggest fear. Really? Yeah, it is. I I love a, I love a client with a point of view within reason. Right. Right. You don't want them to have such a point of view that they are not open to so, listening to yours. But if they absolutely have no idea what yeah. they want. I always say, I would love for you to go out and start buying design books and design magazines. Yeah. And I want you to go and look. Don't you don't need to read all the details. Go go through the pages and literally tear out things that visually excite you. Yeah. That you just look at and you don't try to figure out why you like it. Cause that's where I think people get caught up in the details. I agree. Just pull that piece of paper and stack them. Right. And then what you and I are going to do is sit down and we are going to go through and I'm going to sort of like, uh, was it called the Rorschach test? Like take the piece of paper and say, what do you see here? Yeah. What do you like? And if she, and and, and my client being a woman or a man, let's just say it's a woman for all intents and purposes. She might say, well, I love that kitchen because it reminds me of my grandmother. She has wonderful, you know, countertops and cabinetry or what it's colorful. It's colorful. That's a start, right? Color, right? And then, so, so that's one of the first things I do. The second thing is, I look at their personal style, right. and I hope to God that they have a little bit. Yeah. But I always try 
to look at their personal style and ask them and try to understand what they do for a living. Because if you're in a business where you have a lot of commotion or you're in a com- you know, within a company that there's a lot going on, sometimes when you get back home, you don't want yeah. like color and things and messes. You want to retreat. Right. So I try to I try to also psychologically understand what they need out of their surroundings. And that comes from a conversation about like, tell me about your life. Right. And if they say, Oh my God, my kids are driving me crazy. They have so many toys. Right. That's gonna make me think well, this person needs organization and storage. Right. And how do I build that into their life? Right. So they don't have to see the messes. Or they might say, oh my God, I really just want my bedroom. I want it to be a sanctuary. I just want it to be calm and peaceful. So I know my color palette is going to be, yeah. you know, the neutrals, the beige, you know, all of those yes. things. And t- light colors. Right. So, that's- so I mean, I, you know, I know it's really, I think that's such a good way of going about it. And I think, I think I do the same thing, you know, Pinterest, uh, go online, magazine clippings, you know. But the online thing can be tricky, Susanna. Yes, it here's can. the thing. Yes. Here's the thing. If you start telling your client to go online to get inspiration or yeah. to think or to save, I think what it does is puts them into a hyper stressed, like overstimulated, it's overstimulated. Yeah. Then they start saying, no, I think I like that. Wait, wait, but that's, that's blue and that's red. I right. don't know if I like blue or I have like, they start to really get into a rabbit hole. Right. So I actually like the calmness of turning the page and right. sort of an unexpected view. That's why I love my old design books. I know. I still read them every day. Like I I'm, do too. If I'm having a glass of wine, I come home, I'm like, and I have nothing. I'm like, let me put my phone down. Yep. And let me pick up, you know, a great book. Me too. I mean, I, I actually don't read a book when I get it. Yeah. I actually like let it sit there for, I let it marinate on the table a bit. Oh. And then I pick it up and maybe read a page or two. And then I go back. Oh, that is so not me. Uh, I mean, you got me with a glass of wine and reading the book. But like, I like, like a new book comes into the store and I'm like, is that Mark Sykes? More beautiful book. And I am like, I am like a vulture. I'm like r- ravenously like devouring it. Um, and, but, but just like you, I mean, I revisit them all the time. That Jeffrey Bill Huber book, I think it's The Way Home. That is like my, I've got a fire going. I'm like cozy in my house. Yeah. And I'm just sort of, you know, I could, I, I agree. You know, I think it's a really good point about the idea that, people get overstimulated and sort of over hyper. And I, I actually think in some ways, the fact that there's so much information out there about design, it, people have a harder time connecting with who they really are. And, you know, it, yeah, and I they, mean, of course, I think that the need, you know, I often find a client will come in and say, they'll be exasperated and they'll say, you know, I just, I, I don't know if I'm a minimalist. I don't know if I'm a, ma- a maximalist. And I know we're going to talk about. Throughout you know, the season. You know, I know we're going to talk about different, um, you know, types of decor. But I always say, whoa, whoa, whoa. We don't need to label it right now. You don't need to know if you're boho. We don't need it to have, you know, a label. And and as we know. I love that. You don't, we don't need to label yes, it. Yes, no, we don't you need to You can label. be confused. You can be right. like, you know. Well, you know we're also like part therapists, right? Yeah. I mean, that's what we always say in design uh, is like, 100%. It's, it's like, okay, I am like a marriage counselor. I am an accountant. And I, you know, we're yeah. all wrapped up into one. But I do think that uh, telling people, okay, you don't have to label it. And that inspiration can really come from one wallpaper or one image or one fabric and that you know we are here to sort of hold their hands and help them explore and I always do and I'm sure you do too I know we always uh, you know after we sort of meet the client and, and see the space I do this sort of exercise where I just start putting fabrics in front of them and wallpapers in front of them and just say this doesn't need to end up in your house just respond you know, and that gives me, like you said, you know, I can't pronounce the name of that that psychological test, but you're totally right. Whatever it's Rorschach you know, test, yeah. That you know that you really learn so much about Absolutely. someone, and of course, my hidden hope is that we're going to find that great fabric. The, you know, Anna Spiro always says the trophy fabric. You know, that one fabric that's going to be the inspiration for yeah, everything absolutely. else. And 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 that's another. This segues back into. Yeah, I think art 
is so important. Yes. Because that also gives me a glimpse into how they see, how they will see their space. Yes. And I'm always sort of amazed and dumbfounded when a client comes to me and says, I don't own any art. But that's so that I was. Then gonna, I'm like, whoa! Like, I know. What do you mean? No, you but know? I was going to say about you that I know you are, and I'm I, an absolute. That's like my. But my, I think that's such a personal thing because I think that you art know is so important. Well, no, and I think you're right, and I think. I would say most of my clients come in and say like we I we own maybe one thing or two things or they really don't ha- they need help with art and it's interesting because I know you were probably that girl that twenty year old girl who was like collecting prints oh. or collect you know and from a lot of people that is the you know the eleventh step not the first step yeah I was a collector yeah. before I was anything yeah I remember saving my money to buy a piece of pottery. I was wow. nine. Yeah. Who buys pottery at nine? Yeah. I was, I need a Weller vase. Yeah. It's, you know, I also love the business aspect that I would buy this Weller vase, yeah. some, hopefully at a flea market. Right. And it would be worth a lot more. Right. And then I remember going off to college and having a stack of like, uh, or, you know, a bunch of, of pottery pieces and thinking to myself, like, I don't know if this is really my style. Yeah. But the fact that I was interested in something and I yes. had a perspective on this is, the, yeah. I want my surroundings to be collected. Yeah. I think ultimately that's where I come from in all of my design. Wait, so did you bring this pottery to like your dorm? I did. Yeah. There, well, I wasn't in a dorm. I was oh, in an apartment. Okay. But I did. Okay. And I remember going on dates and like, you know, you'd have your date back into your apartment. Yeah. Because I rolled like that. Yeah. And then my date would be like, oh, there's pottery in here. You know, like, oh my it's God. just the most random Wait, that thing. that reminds me, I, maybe, was it a Seinfeld? Or, like, one of those, like, movies where it's, like, like they went back to the house and, like, the person had a collection of, like, weird dolls. And yeah. they were, like, yeah. uh, back away yeah. from <laughs> this person. Um, so, I mean, listen, I think that, like, you are a collector. And I think that, you know, what a great idea to also ask clients, you know, do you have any collections? Of course. You know? Of do course. You, are there, and even if it's not art, even if it's records. Right. You know, and that just sort of like giving us a little bit of a sense of sort of who they are. Right. And I would honestly, I mean, just to backtrack a little bit, I would rather someone kind of come to an honest uh, assessment of their yeah. reality, meaning like design doesn't mean very much to me, or I haven't spent much time on my design, or right. I'm not sure what I like, then someone who comes with a point of view that's so strong and says, no, I have to have this, 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 and this. Yes. And then I'm sort of looking at them going, well, do you want me to be an order taker? Right. Because like, right. that's not where I, you know, that's okay. not the best way to be as well. So there's there's, it's definitely a spectrum. I like clients that are somewhat in the middle. I like someone who has, obviously, yeah. you know, taste in art. Right. Maybe a collection. Right. Loves to travel. Has a budget. Right. Is willing to take a chance. These are like my holy grail. This is like dream client. Those I are, mean, those, right. No, a dream client is just make it beautiful. Right. Yeah. Okay, okay, fine. But that, we know that, we, as we they know, that exist. client doesn't exist. Those are, those I are. always say that, like, being a designer is, is like being, you know, a commissioned artist, you know? Oh, that's and, such a good point. Right, and you're, you're, you're constrained, you know, and I, I shouldn't say constrained because, of course, you have, a, you have a, you're a patron. Or you have a patron. Yeah, you have a right. patron. You know, right. think about, like, Leonardo da Vinci right. painting, you know, portraits and, you know, them mm. saying, oh, can you make my nose smaller? You know, it, it's, but... <laughs> can you but make me skinnier in this? But it's Leonardo. Leonardo Leonardo da Vinci, you know, and that's, you know, I will say I love decorating and designing for clients. I really do. And I actually think there is a magic that happens in that interplay. And so I don't want to, I don't want to say that commissioned art isn't real art, but there is a freeness and a feeling of just sort of being unleashed when you're doing it for yourself. And, oh, please, you know, I, we also, I feel like we always experiment on ourselves too. You know, that's sort of, it's like, okay, well, this is like a crazy wallpaper. Is this going to make me dizzy? I'll put it in my own powder room and I'll see before I You're put it You're much in a more client. into that than I I I, I yeah. tend to I tend to be a lot more aggressive in my approach in terms of stepping out of my comfort zone with a client than I do with myself. I agree. I noticed no, that. No, but you are the opposite. I am. No, no, you, no. I'm saying I agree about you and you I take agree great that great leaps of faith. I do. 
on I your do. own. I, I am do. like, oh my God. Yeah. What? Yeah. You know, like yeah. I second guess everything. Well, it's funny because, you know, I do think sometimes that probably informs how we design. And for me, sometimes I want to really push my clients to take that leap of faith. And when they're not ready to do it, I'm a little bit like, come on, guys. You know, I have like a hot pink you know, lacquer wall in my house. You can do this. So um, you use your own oh, personal, yes. like, yeah. Leaps of faith. I think I think design is so much about leaps of faith. Okay, so Pam, on that note, um, what do you do with a client that has just terrible taste or, and or is insistent on something that you know is going to be a bad idea? Like, what do you do? Um, I think, you know, that's an, that's an interesting question. I think it depends on the situation. If they are absolutely adamant that, for example, that they need the piano in the room, the upright piano in a perfected room. Yeah. Because their kids play piano. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, but that's an ugly piano. I know. And the bench is ugly and the whole thing is ugly. And we want family photographs in our, you know, sterling frames from, you know, whatever. Yeah. If I have to work around sort of the elephant in the room, yeah, you know, I look at it and I just ask myself, you know, how, how important is this fight? I think it's in everything yes. we do in life, right? So like, you know, it's, it's kind of like what you do with your own personal style. Like how important is this? you know, in your home when your husband's going like, no, I just really want a comfortable sofa. And you're like, yeah. no, but this sofa is so perfect. Right. So you choose your battles. Do you, yeah, I think that's right. I think you have to pick your battles with clients. But if I believe it will absolutely change the equation and, and determine an outcome that I wouldn't be happy with, I will stand my ground. Yes. Ultimately, I cannot force anybody to do anything they don't want to do. But I will say, very honestly, I think it's not a very good look. It's not something I would do. And usually, usually if they do it, if God forbid they do it and they go against everything I've said, I, you know, pray and hope yeah. that it works out. And if it doesn't, I'll say to them, listen, I'll change it. Don't worry. I sort of pat them on the shoulder and right. say, come on, let's get back into it and let's right. fix it. Well, and I, you know, I do the same thing. Um, I often will say to my client, um, if it were me, you know, so we when I get to this, I try not to insert myself in my own feelings until we sort of get to the point where we're at a crossroads. And, and then you say, if it were me. Right. If, if it, it were, were me. me. You know, if it That's were me. That's a great me. title for a book, If It Were Me. Right. Well, because I also think, but I, and it's not, I'm not using it as a ploy as much as I'm just being completely brutally honest. If but it were me. It in, but you're saying it in a very, it's almost like when Andy Cohen is about to, viscerate and right. viscerate someone right. who say with all due respect with all due respect well I say <laughs> no, it's like, I if say, it were me I say <laughs> if it were me I would spend the money redoing those honey colored floors before I buy a piece of furniture you know because that to me that is you know get those bones right and you can have gorgeous de Gournay so wallpaper so hard for people to do that though. it is I know but you can have gorgeous de Gournay wallpaper but if you have orange floors nothing is, you know, that, that wallpaper can't sing. So, you know, I, I think that, um, the, but, but I, that being said, the, if it were me, doesn't always change people's minds. And like we, you know, just the idea of design as being sort of commissioned art, you know, people have to live there. Husbands are going to want their leather recliners and it is, and you know, we, as we really design, I, I would say our group, we design for families who are living real lives. So Absolutely. I think there's nothing more appropriate that can be said about our group of right. designers. We are all moms. Yeah. And we all have budgets and yep. we are not so we we understand what it's like to to buy a good piece of furniture, yes. to spend money on wallpaper, yes. to push the envelope. Like yes. you know, I I think that's truly one of our best or greatest assets. I agree. And making everyday life, sort of elevating it, but understanding that people are going to come to it with things that, you know, whether it's baby equipment or sort of whatever sure, it is. Sure. Dog crates that are like, you know. Okay. Can we just talk about that for a second? Wait, I dog just, crates? Yeah. I just need to pause for a second on the dog crate. So as you know. You have a new puppy. I do. And I, I mean, 
everyone. She's not really a puppy now. She's a year old. It's a he. He's oh, my he. only. He's my only son, Pam. I know. Remember, I, know. I have I know. three girls. So Teddy mm-hmm. is my son. Um, as I'll say to the girls, don't, don't, you know, aggravate your brother just because, like, saying brother, like, is he, gets me is excited. he like Teddy the fourth? Or is he just Teddy? Okay, so it's actually funny that you say that because no, he is just Teddy, but um, but because you know my my husband is the, the four, fifth. he's the, the fifth. fifth. Oh, <laughs> don't knock him down, Pam. He's the fifth, please. Um, and as we know, I was Anne Boleyn, did not produce the male heir, um, and so you know he. So no, but it's funny that you say that though because my sister was the one who came up with Teddy, and she was sort of poking fun at us and was like, "Well, he would be accepted at your golf club with a name like." that you know <laughs> so so Teddy but listen here's the funny thing about Teddy like Teddy is totally our son but you know he's also a shih tzu I mean he is like you know he's like a lady dog you know <laughs> he like sits in your lap anyway but this is so this is actually totally off topic but like yeah this is this is the gussy guys well well um, uh, can I just stop you and yes. say that um the fact that you named him Teddy. Yeah. So he can be accepted in all, in all, you know, in spaces, all Greenwich spaces. and whatever. Correct. I, of course, named my dog Foxy Lady. So the, who, right, a stripper right, name. Right, a yeah. stripper name. Yeah. So it's like, people are like, um, what's your dog's name? And I will say to them, Foxy, Foxy Lady. Yeah. And they're like, um, yeah. okay, that's a little weird. And I'm like, no, I, I do, I cannot have a dog named Alistair. My, yeah. My dog Allie. is, she so is foxy lady. Yeah. She comes in and she's just like, she steals the show. What I want to say is chic dog, like dogs are a part of our lives. I think dogs are, I mean, taking over. I, I especially think in this time of COVID, the amount of people I know who have just gotten dogs, adopted dogs, right. rescued puppies, right. feel like they need that. That's a positive that, side of COVID. It, for there, sure. Listen, so we've, we keep saying it, silver linings. But, you know, there are no chic dog gear. I mean, it, like, li- yeah. What do you mean, gear meaning crates? Cr- I mean, come on. Can someone, no, there is some chic dog gear. Someone work. needs to make a, a Lucite crate. Can, oh. Like, someone needs to make, I want to see, like, a, you know, a faux bois dog house. Or, you know, ha- the gate. Actually, actually. Yeah. Um, if you kind of circle back to the Victorian age when people really pampered their pets or started yeah. to pamper. Yeah. Some of the best sort of dog beds and dog poofs oh. come from that era. Oh, that's and interesting. And you will see them adorned yeah. and, you know, and tufted as if these dogs would sit on like, yeah. you know, I mean, that's truly, people elevated dog status. So there is one lucite or acrylic dog gate that is made by CB2. And I think it was Jennifer Fisher. Uh, it was her collection. And it's out of stock right now, so I can't get it. But, you know, it would be per- the perfect thing in front of my stairs to prevent the dog from going up at night. Mm-hmm. Um, and and it wouldn't so distract. Simple. It wouldn't distract. And it wouldn't Didn't distract. look like a prison gate. Correct. It's so simple. So anyway, it's just an interesting... And then like, you'd knock into it in the middle of the night. You'd right, be coming down. Right. And you'd like... Right, right, you'd right. Go, or your husband would and like right. break his neck. And you'd Liz, be like, Pam. he died because of the dog gate. <laughs> you know what? The Lucite dog gate. You know what? Killed my husband. Right, but you know what? Like, suffer for design. I just, right? Like, I just oh. want to live in, I don't care <laughs> if it's a little impractical. I mean, I don't want anyone to die. But like, you know, I just want to live in a clean house without hideous gates. And is that too much to ask or for? Or train your dog. Yeah. That I, could, that could, that could No, no, happen. he is trained. He's okay. very trained. But he it's goes just, up the stairs and he wants to follow you up the stairs. Yeah, and I, you know, he's, he, yeah, he get all in our business if, if, so we, he's a first floor dog. Okay, can we just right now say that one of our podcasts has to be solely about designing about dogs and Let's cats. do that. Because yeah. seriously, I mean, uh, the other day I was meeting with a client and we were looking at a hand loomed wool rug. Yeah. No. It's going to be Done. $7,000 for yes. her living room. Blah, 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 blah. She has a toy dog. One yeah. of those toy dogs that I think should be wearing diapers all the time because right. she tells me the dog pees right. constantly. Right. So I'm trying to get her to get this rug. And she's saying to me, but what happens when the dog pees and poops on the rug? And I'm thinking to myself, you know, I know sort of the variations of what a rug can handle. Yes. So yesterday I had uh, someone cleaning my 
furniture and my rugs. And yeah. I had a very um, good conversation with him. I showed him the rug and I said, you know, what can, what can I do about a dog peeing on this rug? And he said to me, the most important thing about pee yeah. is you get it up immediately. Right, you soak the, it up, right? The minute the dog pees, you have to clean it because urine yeah. actually, as it dries, stains. Right. And you cannot use any chemicals. Yep. And then he said, forget about like all the standard chemicals that you buy, like Resolve and all. He's like, it doesn't work. Soap right. and water and soak that stuff up. So I think that that is genius. We will have to have a show where we talk about- And we can invite him. Let's do that. Oh, I said to him, I said, you know what? I think we should have, because I mean, imagine the stories he has about what he cleans up yeah. and how he cleans it up. Yeah. I mean, I'm sorry. If you're spending $50,000 on your living room, yeah. you want to know yes. how to get the red wine that your drunk friend spilled totally. out of your sisal. Totally. I think that, um, you know, to do a little research and to look into what is out there in terms of top sort of pet friendly carpets, pet friendly uh, gear, gear pet, oh, and des- have a design friendly pet gear, right? right? I think that that- We should do would, that. We're going to do it. We okay. Do. And we're you know what it. we should do? We should have Foxy Lady yeah. and Teddy as yeah. our special guest. We could get little dog earphones on them yeah. and we could say Foxy Lady. So what's it like living with Pamela? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And of course, Teddy would be like, well, I only eat the best food. So wait. <laughs> it's steak and caviar so, for me, ladies. No, you know what? <laughs> My dog's like, um, he, I eat kibble. Right. And so whatever. Teddy. <laughs> Don't worry. So we've tried to give him like fancy stuff and it, let's just say Do you know it, it was National Dog Day the other day? I didn't. I missed the opportunity to post like my first National Dog Day as a dog owner. And you, you missed the post. I missed the oh post. Oh my God. Well, I, I miss posts all the yes. time. But I did find out it was National Dog Day. And I'll tell you how I found out, which is actually a funny story. So my kids, of course, know because they are on social media yes. like crazy. Yeah. And they decide to honor our foxy lady by giving her an enormous amount of dog treats. Probably a couple bags full. So, oh dear. The next morning, it's like seven in the morning, and I've got to get up for work. And my husband's like walking around the house, and he's going, he's like, oh my God, this dog <laughs> shit everywhere. <laughs> there are three shits in Leo's room, there oh are two God. shits in Kiki's room. And, 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 she, and then he's this like, This is why Teddy is relegated to the bottom floor, by the way. Oh, yeah. And then yeah. he's like, And. He shit on your jute rug. And I'm like, no, the jute rug. Not the jute. Not the jute. Yeah. And he's like, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, it gets into those fibers. And you, it's like, oh, it, my it never God. comes you out. You almost right? actually want to cut the fibers out. You think right. if you cut it and right. give it a haircut? Right, no. Oh. That's, um, so okay, gross. so circling back. So we will get back to the pets. But circling back, okay, just to end our very first gussy um, special topic, if somebody is like, let's say someone in their 20s, doesn't have access to a designer, doesn't, you know, and is trying to create a, really do their first sort of foray into decorating for themselves, where should they start? Um, I would say if you're in your 20s, you're probably on a budget, right? So totally. you, you haven't hit that like stride. Yeah. You know, shop at great flea markets and thrift shops and multi-dealer shops. Like, yeah. visit the little antique store and go to sales and yeah. do all those things. So I would just say, like, you know, look around. Go on auction sites. Yeah. Do, do you know, find your, find different things and, and go to estate sales. Yes. That's a great way. I mean, an estate sale will blow your mind. Because you could go to an estate sale and then see, like, Oh my God, I would never cover the couch in that floral print. Right. But I love it. It's right. comfortable. It fits within my budget. Right. And then there you go. Well, you know, we're actually going to, we have a show. We're going to, we're planning a show on that. Estate sales? About, yeah, it's treasure hunting oh, and estate sales. Please. We're going to plan many shows on so, that. So, yeah, no, well, I know. But I don't know if I really want to give away all my secrets. Yeah, well, the I secrets. mean, you know. The, but I'll, I'll share. But yeah, we can we can share a little bit. All right, so. Should we get to our very first drum roll, The Gussie? Give me The Gussie. Today's The Gussie is about the five design styles that we find ourselves designing for clients or even maybe reflect us. Okay. So the five styles. I mean, first would be the maximalist. Yeah. Someone who, which I consider you to be a maximalist. I know you do. I know you do. I'm a you maximalist you in, are. In, you in, are. in all elements right. of life. Right. And yes. maximalist is all about gussing it up, it right? It is. It's like, you know yeah. what? I'm just going to put a little something. Yeah. 
Um, I'd say the maximalist, which I thought I was for a long time. There's oh, I so don't think you of you as a maximalist, but maybe oh, that was. But I was. You were? Yeah, I was. Actually, there I, I've seen some rooms in your house yeah, that no, yeah. I was. But I think I think, and then of course there's minimalism. Yes, there's people who like I think I veer towards that a little bit more. Now, do you think minimalism and modernism are the same? Um, There's definitely crosshairs there, right? right? They definitely Well, overlap. I mean, the aesthetic of modernism is a pared down, yeah. very simple form, more form right. and less about, you know, right. an overture towards, uh, right. you know, like lavishness. It's more like a pared down form. So yes, okay. minimalism, minimalism, modernism, those kind of are, go hand in hand right. for me. So, and like minimalism is, you know, I think of it as less color, um, you know, certainly maybe you'll have like a red coffee table or something like that, but it's not, you don't have this, the cacophony of, yeah. of sort of that, that a maximalist would, would have. have. Exactly. Yeah. So it's a, it's a pared, da- a pared down aesthetic, you okay. know, so clean lines, uh, not a lot of, you know, you don't throw in florals and checks. Yep. You would maybe just do very simple, clean rooms. Yep. Okay. So then, so that's two. The third one would be, I think, I mean, you know. The bohemian yeah. sort of boho chic. Yeah. I boho would say that's a pretty, that's a a, a sector of yep. of design right now. Yes. Totally. I think both. The Marrakesh meets. Yep. Flea market yep. meets. The flocatis, the, yeah. you know, uh, the plant, mm-hmm. you know, in the corner. Maybe, and maybe, in so, you know, Boho can have elements of maximalism because, you know. Absolutely. There's that great book. Hot- I actually think it does. A Boho is not is not a minimalist. Right. Boho's like, let's get another, you know, calf, t- get, put yes. on our calf tans. Let's get let's like some throw it over the sofa. In. I always yeah. think of, you know, Rebecca Duravnell or, yes. you know, um, Carolina Irving in the hot, the hot Bohemian book, you know, where she, her par- her Paris apartment, where it's sort of like none of the, the patterns sort of, and, and fabrics that she has necessarily resonate with each other or, you, or or don't they don't match mm-hmm. but it's just she just filled it with things that she loves so and yeah. that that to me has you know it's maximalist but it's also bohemian um but also I think bohemian the key to bohemian really good bohemian is it's it, it almost has to be something that's you didn't spend a lot of money on right that's what makes it sort of bohemian like they talk about bohemian lux yes. I'm like mm, bohemian lux isn't oh, really that's interesting but it's like bohemian is about taking the found object and making it really cool. I mean, 70s was about the boho. Right. You know, it was but about... But that's interesting, though, because, you know, I think of, like, boho bags that are, like, $3,000. Yeah. Well, you know? Th- that's totally those, against the whole bohemian lifestyle. Those, the bohemian li- lifestyle is to throw away right. everything that was, you know, costly and expensive yeah. and make it more, like, found and cool. Right. Well, it's like La Boheme or, yeah. you know, Rent, which mm-hmm. was sort of the modern, you know version of La Boheme. Okay, so, you Transitional. Know, transition. I mean, that. see, I think of myself as a maximalist, I, but also <clears throat> transitional. I feel like transitional is like, in design, is like a weird word. Like, yeah. what is transitional? Yeah, why? I agree. It's like, it's like a weird, like, it well, has... Well, so here's, let me break it down, what okay. I think, because I've thought about this before, because I very much think of myself as transitional, and I think the idea is that it really is sort of traditional meets contemporary so or meets modern and so I think that it's it's people sort of I think the idea is there there's a transition right and it's a transition that that isn't um permanent it's a transition in within the space that is that is constantly moving and in flux so give me a piece of furniture in your house that you consider to be very transitional well it's interesting because I actually don't know that I could say one piece of furniture is transitional you know in and of itself I mean uh, well one there uh, for example you know a lucite chair with a p an old sort Pierre of Pierre Frey 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 okay. embroidery okay. that would be that transitional, transitional to it's a, me. it's a mix it's but, a mix but i think that rather than pieces of furniture i think you're more likely to see spaces that are transitional you know so for example my dining room i have blue lacquer walls and i have magenta pink faux leather chair fronts, but my chair backs are counten and tout check, you know? So that's really transitional, right? That check is, 
is the buffalo check. You know, yeah. I mean, that's it's not even the buffalo check. It's the it's like the 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 one step before that preppy preppy check. You know, and my living room, I have um, you know scalamandra. So you think you're more transitional? Well, I do, but I think I think you can be a transitional transitional maximalist. You know, I, and I think that real what that means is is that you know I think I think tr- of transitional as traditional with a twist. I think transitional is about understanding that you could go both you could be both boho or or modern or traditional as long as it's within good taste that's what transitional means for me it means within good taste in the style so you might not want a claw foot you know um server in your dining room but you're willing to go with a great 19th century piece that has good bones and, right. you know, it's, um, you know, an English server, serpentine server. You know, you're willing to put that in with a modern wallpaper. Right. So I think that's what transitional is. And I think at the core of, as, as a designer, I think all designers are somewhat transitional. Well, right. I was going to say. Does that mean you so swing both I ways? I think sort of what you're saying um, in some respect that I totally agree with is this idea that transitional feels less of a commitment of course than it does. minimalism. Oh, of or course. Mo- you know, just because it gives you the flexibility of combining different styles. But I also think, um, and again, it's easy for me to say because I think of myself very much as transitional, right? I think transitional is that sort of style that transcends time and place and trend. And it's really about pooling the best things from all of these different styles and putting them in one place. And in that way, I feel like transitional, and I, and I don't use safe as a negative word in this respect. I think transitional it's is very- It's safe because it's- It's going to last. It's going to last. Because what, you know, Absolutely. ultimately what style is, is, you know, is personal and is not necessarily trend focused. You know, I think, I, I think really so much of this discussion we've had today is about the fact that style comes from, you know, deep within, whether it's collection or things that you sort of respond to. Or your surroundings. Or your, or surroundings. your life at that moment. What your life is like. What your life is like. What I think you that's, do. Yeah. You know, so I think in that way that. Did um, we hit all five no, in the gussie? No, we didn't. We, we Are did we not. Missing we're one? missing We're missing traditional. Which oh, is, well, I trad know. is always like. So I when mean, you think of trad, trad, are you like Mary Obwada, you know, florals? What you? What is your sort of trad? You know, are you thinking? I mean, Victorian. No, 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 no. Traditional for me would be like. Um, I mean, honestly, I think it, it it leans towards more like brown furniture. We call it brown yes. furniture, which was like I would, was like such yeah. a no no. And then I would also say traditional also is an aesthetic where you bring in period pieces. Yep pieces that have that resonate in terms of their age and their value right and then I would say a traditional person is someone who is sort of bucking all trends right so you might see like you know older paintings older patterns you know some of the classics Schumacher has that great you know set of fabrics and wallpapers that are yes that are um what is it this 100 years 100 year fabric so I think yeah yeah I mean uh, that's to me what a traditionalist is, yep. you know, and also willing to put things in their house that aren't necessarily used today, right? But might have, you know, some sort of significance. Like, you know, you'd have your tea set out on yes. your break front. You might not even have tea anymore, but right. that's your traditional look. Or right. you might want, you know, um, certain drapery treatments, right? Like well, chin drapes. Yeah, the chin drapes or the tufting or the ta- you know the tassels that we sort of had talked about um, earlier, and very much my childhood home still looks like that. You know, I and, really uh, yes, and you know mm. uh, my my mother has redone it, but at the end of the day, that She's is a traditional. She loves her chintz sofas, you know, and that is and her brown furniture. It's funny. There was an article in the New York Times. I think it was about. Oh God! It must have been about six or seven years ago, and they talked about like w- what a wasp is. What yeah. what, what like sort yeah. of these wealthy families in the New England? Yeah. They never change their decor. It's yes. like it's like the old silk sofa has tears in it, and they yes. do not care. I think of Tom Shearer's his 
Southampton, is it Southampton or East Hampton? I can't remember, but a Hampton home that had been in his family for so many years. And it's in one of the forwards to his, um, in the forward to his book. I, now, I don't remember if he has two or three books, but um, actually, I think he has two. So it's his, it's his original book. And it's, it, you know, he's sitting on these white painted steps. And the furniture in this family house that's been in this family for so many years is threadbare. And he's just, you know, puts whitewash on it. He has the real old school loop chairs that have been in the family forever and probably were brown. Right. He just, you know, slapped some paint on it, threadbare sofas. But it has such a feeling of being lived in and just... It just to timelessness. Me, that's traditional. So we hit the five. We hit the five. We got. We, that's our we got, first. The gussy. Yes. Be sure to join us again next week where we discuss the first step in beginning a personal design project. My my personal favorite: taking stock of what you own. So like we're gonna do a little more condo. We're gonna. So do can a little, you can you tease a title for this next podcast? I can, Pam. Okay. Okay. Next week's podcast is. Don't yuck someone's yum. Mm, those are words to live by. I mean, I'll, the, these are don't yuck solemn words yum. in the Hayworth household. Really? Yes. yes. Just okay. Um, so don't yuck someone's yum, and and you know we're going to be talking about um, tre- what is one person's treasure is another person's trash, right. and we're going to be talking about um, taking stock and purging and. And oh, so the Marie Kondo yes, episode. Yes, yes. Too bad we can't get her. Next oh. time we will get her. Con Marie. Oh, I'd love to have Con Marie. All okay. right, thank you guys. We'll see you next time on The Gussie. Thanks for listening, everyone. Make sure you subscribe to The Gussie so you never miss an episode. For more of The Gussie, please check out our blog at thegussie.com and follow us on Instagram at The Gussie Show. See you next time. <laughs>